Hello everybody, welcome to my channel, She Smiles at the Future. Um, for those of you who have been sub to my channel for a while now, know you're not having the Mandela effect. I changed my name again. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, you know, I've been kind of like playing around with different names and honestly this name that i picked now and i i really want to just stick with this name um that was my original youtube channel name when i first got on youtube um i started i have another channel actually but then i ended up launching chit chat and tea with amanda marie and i ended up actually getting a lot more subscribers with that channel um, cause I put so much effort into it in the beginning, but my original channel name that I had picked was going to be, she smiles at the future. So I've decided just to go back to that original name because I actually really do like it. Um, it's, it's some, it's from, you know, Proverbs, um, I believe it's 3125 that it's referring to speaking of the woman in Proverbs. Um, and it says she smiled or laughs at the future, knowing her and her family are prepared. Um, so it's a, you know, it's always been one of my favorite verses. So anywho, that is now my name, formerly Chit Chat and Tea, Amanda Marie, formerly she smiles inside the firmament. Now I am she smiles at the future. Anywho, good to be back. It's been a while. Um, uh, been busy, busy, busy. Um, haven't you know had a few ideas? I since I finished up my whole narcissist series of the book I covered, um, uh, been playing around with a few different ideas am in the process of reading this book that I shared on my last video. Um, I think I'm pretty sure I did, um, shared with you guys that I might end up, you know, doing, covering that book with you guys still not a hundred percent. If I'm going to, I want to finish reading it first and then see if I really feel like led to, to cover it. But what I am feeling led to talk about right now and that's the reason I'm jumping on here. And I actually have some time in my life at this moment. Um, I'm taking a break in between housework and having to go make dinner. So, and my youngest is with my other, my daughter, my older daughter. So I'm not, I don't have her right now. So I have kind of peace and quiet right now. Um, I've, really and this has been on my heart and I've made other videos concerning this um not you know topic um and I've been wanting to share this with you guys actually for a while and it's concerning um the Roman Catholic Church um I just want to say you know right off the bat that I don't do this in a spirit of um you know, malice or contempt or anything like that. I do this purely out of love for the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, and I, like I mentioned, I have made a couple of other videos Concerning the Roman Catholic Church, I have two of them, I believe. One, the unholy, I called it the unholy Roman Catholic Church, Church part one and two. They were just quick little, um, like, exposés I put together, like, with pictures and, you know, um, I didn't speak or I wasn't in the video. You can check those out if you're curious. Um, to further expose the unholy Roman Catholic church. I've decided to share with you guys. Um, it's a writing that Keith green did. Now I've mentioned Keith, Keith green in past videos. He was a, um, singer, songwriter, pianist, um, 
from the 70s primarily is when he was really at the height of his, um, you know, popularity or whatever. He uh, was a Christian. He came out of the Jesus movement um, in the 70s, which now is kind of like everybody kind of, not everybody, but a lot more people are familiar with what that is because of that movie they just put out, uh, Jesus Revolution. And I am not somebody who is really promoting that movie. I just want to kind of put that on the table because I definitely don't um, subscribe to a lot of the theology and... Um, you know, the whole thing, movement behind the Jesus movement, actually. Now, I do believe that, like in anything, there were genuine, you know, um, con conversions that took place during the Jesus movement. Um, but I think a lot of the doctrine and theology that has come out of it and a lot of the you know after effects of it even all these years later you know we're talking whatever 45 years later whatever it is we see how it's also there's been a lot of watering down of the western church um you know in the u.s and then the u.s kind of trickles out to a lot of other countries so I, I'm not promoting that movie and I'm not um, saying that I'm on board with all of that. Again, God can work in any situation that he chooses to. And I do believe that this man, Keith Green, who again was someone who come out of the Jesus movement in the 70s, he, he was not you know, he, he got, he was, had a conversion experience, a radical conversion experience. I believe he was in his early twenties when he did. And he and his wife became born again Christians and really had a huge impact on the church here in the, in the U S. Um, he was from California. He was actually from the same place I'm from in California, which is kind of cool. Um, and he was a extremely gifted pianist and musician and songwriter, like prodigal, prodigal, you know, prodigy, sorry, prodigy as a child. You can even go on YouTube and find um, video footage of him playing as a child on some, I don't know what show it was, you know, he was playing and just phenomenal. His music is phenomenal, phenomenal. I listen to his music frequently. Uh, my children listen to his music, all of them, all, even the ones that aren't, that are kind of struggling right now um, with their walk with the Lord. They still listen to Keith Green. <laughs> they, they, you know, um, every single one of my children love Keith Green. My husband loves Keith Green. We all love, we're Keith Green fans in this house. And if you have never listened to his music, I highly recommend checking him out. Um, very, very just anointed, powerful songs. Okay, I just wanted to kind of, for anybody who's not familiar with him, I just wanted to kind of put that out there and say, this is who he is. By the way, he was, he died very young. He and two, if you don't know this, he and two of his children died in a plane at a crash. Um, there is speculation, and I've looked into this, that it wasn't an accident and I wouldn't be surprised at all. He was having such an impact on people. His music was having such a, such a huge impact on people. And what I'm about to share with you, he wrote 
not long before he died. Okay. And this, this, the one I'm about to share with you is the uh, one concerning Roman Catholicism, but he also wrote, I, I'm not sure if he completed it. I can't remember. And it's hard to find that one on the internet. I tried looking, I was able to get little bits of it. He did, he also did one about Mormonism, exposing Mormonism. And this one is exposing Roman Catholicism. So he was on fire for the Lord. He was on fire for the Lord in every way. He was a truly seeking the truth. And, and, and I, I think I said, you know, he died at about 21. And then, I mean, I'm sorry, he was converted at like 21 and he ended up dying. I think he was only like 28 when he was in that plane crash. Like I said, it was, he had two of his children with him that were only like four and two, I think. And then his wife was pregnant with a baby that was like, uh, you know, she had just found out she was pregnant, I think, when, when this happened. And I think that there was, they had another baby um, that she had that didn't go on this plane ride with them. That, you know, so the wife is still alive and the daughter. I, I want to say that maybe there's two daughters still alive, but I might be mistaken in that. Anyway, you know, really tragic, you know, um, he was young when he died, but it was his time. Okay. But his impact is just been wow on, on Christian, on really on so many people. And it's a little suspicious, sus, as they say nowadays, that he would put these things out and then that happened to him. And I think because my opinion is because he was having such a huge impact, huge on, on people for Christ, they had to shut him up. Because I am telling you, if he would have continued on, he was the type of person, and I've watched everything I can find on him on YouTube, you know, um, he did sermons, he, he did teachings, um, and things like that, and I've watched everything I could find on him, and he had just, he was this person that he would not bend, he was seeking the truth, because he didn't grow up in the church, he actually grew up in Christian science, um, I, you know, is the, what he grew up in. So he didn't grow up in like Christianity, you know, or anything. So he had, he was like taking it in like a sponge. He was just learning so much and just wanted to get to the truth, you know, was, and, and was determined to do that in his search. And he was the type of person that he just had to share this and, and share with everybody. So I just have a lot of respect for him. Um, he's someone that I look and say he is a, one of the, you know, he's someone that is truly someone who's on fire for the Lord. And I could just go on and on about him because honestly, there's just so much more I could say. And actually, now that I'm saying all of this, I actually am thinking about you know, maybe I should like, cause they have a, there's a book, um, like a, you know, biography book on him and I've been wanting to get it actually and read it. I've watched a lots about, about him. You know, I've lots, I've watched lots and lots about him, but maybe I could get that book and read it on my channel. Cause that I would, I think that would be something I would, I don't know if anybody out there would be interested in that, but I think it would be you know, kind of cool. Anyway, getting back to the Catholic Church, he did this whole thing. He called it the Catholic Chronicles. Okay. By Keith Green. And I'm just going to share it with you guys. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. And again, this is not out of contempt, hatred, anything like that. This is coming from a place of wanting to share the truth, God's truth. Okay. Because ultimately that ultimately that's what we all need. We need the truth. The truth will set us free. 
and my heart is to do that with people. And that's why part of the big reason I have this channel is to do that. So here we go. Um, so Catholic Chronicle 1. One might wonder why, in a scriptural look at the doctrines of the Catholic Church, I would choose this subject. The Roman interpretation of the Lord's Supper. Yes, this is so the first thing he, he's covering in these Catholic Chronicles is the Holy Eucharist. Eating the flesh of deity, he titles it. Okay. More commonly known as communion. For the first of the Catholic Chronicles. So he put out many of these Chronicles. Okay. This was the first one he ever did. Most Protestants, number one, would expect me to deal with what they might consider the most obvious departures from biblical foundation, such as the worship of and prayers to the Virgin Mary, the infallibility of the Pope, purgatory and prayers for the dead, or the history or of the torture and burning of accused heretics, and such like that. But for this first article, I believe that we should get right into the root before we begin exploring the branches of Roman doctrine and practice. Any Catholic who has even a small knowledge of his church knows that the central focus of the, each gathering known as the Mass is the Holy Eucharist. The Eucharist the word Eucharist is a Greek word that means thanksgiving. In the gospel accounts of the Last Supper, Jesus is described as giving thanks before breaking the bread, Luke twenty two nineteen, And so this word became a proper name for the Lord's Supper in the early Catholic Church. Today, it is more commonly associated with the elements in communion, especially the host or the wafer. Although the ceremony itself is still called the Holy Eucharist. Now, you might be wondering why I'm taking so much time and effort to explain something as harmless as the ceremony known around the world as communion. If you've probably taken part in a communion service, so why make all this fuss about bread and wine? Why? because that's where the similarity between evangelical communion services and the Roman Catholic Mass ends at the bread and the wine. Transubstay, I can never say this word, guys. This word is one of my pet peeve words. Transubstantiation, there it is. <laughs> the 18-letter word above is a complete theological statement and the name of a doctrine, out of which springs the most astounding set of beliefs and practices that has ever been taught in the name of a religion. Very, very few people know that the Catholic Church actually believes and teaches concerning the subject, and I am convinced that even fewer Catholics realize themselves what they are taking part in. From earliest childhood, this is the body of Christ, is all they've ever heard when they, the priest gingerly placed that wafer on their tongue. And as they grew up, it was such a natural and normal part of their religious life that their minds never even questioned the fact that Jesus Christ himself was actually in their mouth. It might be hard for you to believe, but that's exactly, literally, what transubstantiation means the roman catholic church teaches their flocks that the bread and the wine used in the mass actually physically turn into the flesh and blood of jesus christ after the priest blesses them during the liturgy the ceremony although this in itself might shock you it is really only the beginning for the implications and practical conclusions of this doctrine are absolutely mind boggling. Exclusive authority. For example, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that since their priests are the only ones who have the authority from God, 
to pronounce the blessings which changes the elements of communion. I'm sorry, that's a little confusing the way they, they worded this. To pronounce the blessings which changes the elements of the communion into the actual body and blood of Jesus, that they are the only church where Jesus physically resides. Even now, let me quote a letter written to one of the girls in our ministry from a devoted Catholic. To explain, the Catholic Church would take volumes, but basically the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ, who, when he was here on earth, by Jesus Christ, sorry, when he was here on earth, it is the only church founded by Jesus. The greatest asset of our church is that we have Jesus present in our Holy Eucharist. He is really here, body, soul, and divinity. He is God and in his omnipotence can be do anything he wishes. And he decided to remain with us until the end of the world in the form of a host in the Holy Communion. If you think that this is just an isolated opinion of someone on the fringe of the church or that this Catholic church, that the Catholic church as a whole does not really believe or teach this, I beg you to read on. For not only is this the official teaching of Rome, but according to irreversible church decree called dogma, anyone who does not hold to this belief in the most explicit detail is accursed and damned forever. The Council of Trent. When Europe was electrified by the eloquent preaching of the 16th century Reformation, the Roman Catholic hierarchy gathered together her theologians who worked for, the, for three decades on the preparation of a statement of faith concerning the doctrine of transubstantiation. The doc, document remains to this day the standard of Catholic, Catholic doctrine. I'm sorry about my tongue getting twisted, guys. As the Second Vatican Council commenced in 1963, Pope John the. 23rd declared I do not accept entirely all that has been decided and declared at the Council of Trent. What did the Council of Trent decide and declare? Well, some of the first sections are as follows. Canon 1. If anyone shall deny the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore entire Christ are truly, really, and substantially contained in the sacrament of the whole, most holy Eucharist and shall say that he is only in a sign, in it as a sign or as a figure, let him be accursed. Number Canon 2. If anyone shall say that the substance of the bread and the wine remains in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist together with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. If anyone shall say that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored in the Holy Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, even with the open worship of Latria, and therefore not be venerated with any particular fest, festal cele, cele, sorry, celebrity, not to be solemnly carried about in processions according for the praiseworthy and universal rites and customs of the Holy Church, and that he is not to be publicly set before the people and to be adorned, and that his adorners are idolaters, let him be accursed. The worship of the host. So thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Okay. Thou shalt not bow down thy, thyself to them nor serve them. The second commandment, Exodus 24 through 5. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 23. In canon um, 4, a rite of passage, um, I'm sorry, a rite of worship called Latria was spoken of. This is not just an ancient... Um, custom. It is thoroughly practiced today in many masses. And after the bread has been supposedly changed into Christ by the priest, it is a holder called a monstrance. A monstrance. 
it's placed in a holder called a monstrance, okay? The host or the wafer. And before this monstrance, the Catholic must bow and worship. Worship. This is an act called genuflecting. The little wafer as God. Sometimes they have these processions where they solemnly march as the congregation bows and offers praise and worship to this piece of bread. The Roman teaching that Jesus Christ is physically present in each morsel of bread creates many other doctrinal and practical problems. For instance, when the service is over, what happens to all those leftover wafers that have been changed into Christ? Do they just change back into bread again when the priest goes home? I'm afraid not. For according to canon number three of the Council of Trent, they stay flesh. And they don't think that 400-year-old, and don't think that a 400-year-old decree is just some dusty old manuscript in a museum case somewhere. It is still completely adhered to, passionately practiced, as an example, here is a passage from an official Catholic home instruction book copyrighted in 1978. Jesus Christ does not cease to exist under the appearances of bread and wine after the mass is over. Furthermore, some hosts are usually kept in Catholic, all Catholic churches. In these hosts, Jesus is physically and truly present. As long as the appearances of bread remain, Catholics therefore have the praiseworthy practice of making visits to our Lord present in their churches. To him, offer their thanks, their adoration, to ask for help and forgiveness, in a word, to make him the center around which they live their daily lives. This is an incredible interpretation of how to make Jesus the center of your daily life. That is amazing, guys. I didn't realize that they were like, okay, there's not that much left. I was just kind of checking. I didn't realize they were like, keeping these wafers after the mass is over and then whatever the leftover wafers I guess from that mass you can go visit these wafers at the church and go pray to them and worship them that's crazy wow okay when did this teaching begin this teaching of transubstantiation does not date back to the Last Supper, as most Catholics suppose. It was a controversial topic for many centuries before officially becoming an article of faith, which means that it is, it is essential to salvation, according to Rome. The idea of a physical presence was vaguely held by some, such as Ambrose, but it was not until 831 AD that Pas Pasiacus Radbertus, ooh, that's a name, a Benedictine monk published a treatise, a treatise, openly advocating the doctrine. Even then, for almost another four centuries, theological, theological was, was, there's a lot of um, typos in this, I'm sorry, was over this teaching uh, by bishops and people alike until at the fourth Lateran Council in 1215 AD, it was officially defined and canonized as a dogma, a teaching or doctrine that can never be reversed or re revealed. That's dogma. Repealed. Sorry, not revealed. Repealed. It is equal in authority to the Bible by Pope Innocent III. Okay. Church historians tell us that when this doctrine first began to be taught, the priests took great care that not one crumb should fall. Oh, yeah, 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 I would think so. Lest the body of Jesus be hurt or even eaten by a mouse or a dog. There were quite serious discussions as to what should be done if a person were to vomit, oh Lord, after receiving the sacrament. Yeah, what, what do you do then? <clears throat> At the Council of Constance, it was argued that if a communion, 
communicant spilled some of the blood on his beard. Both bread and the man, I'm sorry, not bread, both the beard and the man should be destroyed by burning. What? By burning. That's, wow. Jeez, Louise. Talk about pressure not to, you're like in mass taking uh, communion and God, you know, if you, God forbid you spilled a little bit of the, the wine, you're in big trouble. You're getting burned at the stake. Ay, yay, yay. Not saying they, he's not saying they ever really officially made that a, 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 you know, a rule in the church, but they, they argued over it. Okay. How Rome views the Bible. Before we proceed to look at what the Bible has to say on this subject, it is important to understand that the official Catholic view of the scriptures, according to the unquestionable decree, they hold that church tradition has equal authority with the Bible. This is not just a theological view, but it was made an article of faith by the same Council of Trent in 1546. And again, this view is completely held by the church today. The teachings of the church will always be in keeping with the teachings of scripture. And it is through the teachings of the church that we understand more fully truths of sacred scripture. To the Catholic church belongs the final word and the understanding and meaning of the Holy Spirit in the words of the Bible. Okay. Here's a little article that was put in here that they shared. Um, it says, for centuries, Catholic laity were actually discouraged from reading the Bible themselves, even though they began changing a hundred years ago. Bible reading often is seen as a Protestant activity. In fact, some evangel evangelical Christians use the passage from the Bible to preach against the Catholic Church, which the Pope said is truly ironic since the Bible is the church's book. It was the church that decided which of the ancient Christian writings were inspired and were to be considered for the New Testament, the Pope said. And it was the church that interpreted it for hundreds of years. The primary setting for scriptural interpretation is the life of the church, he said. Not because the church is imposing some kind of power play, but because the scriptures can be understood fully only when one understands the way they gradually came into being. That's from the Catholic Herald back in um, November 10th, 2010. That's when um, I believe that um, Benedict was the Pope, right? It wasn't Pope Francis yet. Okay. Yeah. Because it says the news article was Pope calls for renewed study of the Bible. Okay. So, and explaining the premise used in interpreting the Bible. Usually the meaning of the scriptures is sought out by those who specifically train are trained for this purpose. And in the conc their conclusions, they know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm continuing the, this is a, another quote. They know that no explanation of the scriptures which contradicts the truths constantly taught by the infallible church can be true. Anyone can see how such a mode of interpretation can be dangerously used to manipulate scripture to mean absolutely anything at all. Who has not observed this of the various cults, the Moonies, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, all backed up with their false teachings, with new revelations and inspired interpretations of the scriptures? Such, each claiming that the Holy Spirit revealed these things to the new truth, these new truths to their founders. One opens themselves to all kinds of deception when they judge the Bible by what their church or pastor teaches. Instead of judging what their church or pastor teaches by the Bible. Catholic proof texts explained. This is, this is, I'm wrapping it up now, guys. Okay. With this in mind, we briefly discuss the two main passages of scripture that 
the Roman church uses while trying to show that Jesus himself taught transubstantiation. John 6, 54 through 55, it says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Catholics are taught here that Jesus is explaining how he is literally offering them his flesh and blood so that they may have eternal life by physically eating him. With just a little study of the whole passage, include verses 27 through 71, it's clear that Jesus was not talking about physical, but spiritual food and drink. Food is eaten to satisfy hunger. And in verse 35, Jesus says, he who cometh to me shall never hunger. Now, Jesus is not promising eternal relief from physical hunger pains. He is, of course, speaking of the spiritual hunger in a man, in man for righteousness and salvation. And he promises to those who will come to him that he will satisfy their hunger of for these things forever. Therefore, to come to him is to eat. See also Matthew 5, 6, 11, 28, and John 4, 31 through 34. We drink also to satisfy thirst. And again, in verse 35, Jesus tells us, He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Therefore, to believe on him is to drink. See also John 4, 13 through, 4, 13 through 14. No one can say that Jesus was here establishing the eating and drinking of his literal flesh and blood to give eternal life. For in verse 63, he says, it is of the spirit who gives life. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are a spirit. They are spirit and they are life. Thus, Jesus makes clear what we should be eating and drinking to have eternal life. Matthew 26, 26 and 28, this is my body, this is my blood. See also Matthew 4, 4. Catholics base their, their whole religious system on this inter their interpretation of these two verses. They adamantly teach that right, that right here. Jesus is pronouncing the first priestly blessing that mysteriously changes the bread and the wine into his body and blood. The absolute folly of such a conclusion is proved by the one observation. He was literally still there before, during, and after they had partaken of the bread and the cup. He was not changed into some liquid and bread. His flesh was still on his bones and his blood was still in his veins. He had not vanished away to reappear in the form of a piece of bread or a cup of wine. Let's look closer at his words. No one can deny that here we have figurative language. Jesus did not say, tutu, tutu gianati, this has become, or this is turned into, but tuto, tuto esti, this is, i.e. signifies, represents, or stands for. It is obvious that Jesus, Jesus's meaning was not literal, but symbolic. He wasn't the first in the Bible to claim figuratively that a glass of liquid, liquid was really blood. One time, David's friend heard him express a strong desire for water from the well of Bethlehem. In spite of extreme danger, these men broke through the enemy lines of the Philistines and brought the water to him. When David found out what these men had risked, they've risked their lives in this way, he refused the, to drink the water, exclaiming, it is not this, it, sorry, is not this the blood of men who went in jeopardy of their lives? 2 Samuel 23, 17. Throughout the Gospels, we find similar metaphorical language. Jesus referring to himself as the door, the vine, the light, the root, the rock, the bright and morning star, as well as the bread. The passage is written with such common language that it is plain to say any observant reader that the Lord's Supper was intended primarily as a memorial and in no sense a literal sacrifice. Do this in remembrance of me. Luke twenty two nineteen. This is the, the, the very end, guys. True pagan origins. Where did this teaching and practice really come from? 
former Roman Catholic priest Bart Brewer explains, like many of the beliefs and rites of Romanism, transubstantiation was first practiced by pagan religions. The noted historian Durant said that the belief in transubstantiation as practiced by the priests of the Roman Catholic system is one of the oldest ceremonies of primitive religion. The syncretism and the mysticism of the Middle East was great factors in influencing the West, particularly Italy. In Egypt, priests would consecrate messed cakes, which were supposed, supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. The idea of transubstantiation was also characteristic of the religion of Mithra, whose sacraments of cakes and Homaya drink closely parallel Catholic Eucharist rites. The idea of eating the flesh of deity was most popular among the people of Mexico and Central America long ago before they heard of Christ. And when the Spanish missionaries first landed in those countries, their surprise was heightened when they witnessed a religious rite which reminded them of communion. An image made of flour and after constant cons consecration by priest was dis dis sorry, distributed among the people who ate it, declaring it was the flesh of deity. So why do they teach it? Before concluding out our first chronicle, the question needs to be asked. Why does the Roman Catholic Church need to have such a doctrine? Why do they think that Jesus wants them to physically eat him. That is what truly puzzled me as I read astounded through the catechism and doctrinal instruction books. But the answer to that question is a sad one. As I said before, the implications and practical conclusions of this teaching of transubstantiation are substantially worse than the doctrine itself. And like a great web spun by an industrious spider, Rome's teachings spiral out from this central hub, like the spokes of a wheel. In Catholic Chronicle 2, we're going to look intently at the next direct result of transubstantiation in official Catholic systematic theology. Systemic, sorry, systemic theology. The sacrifice of the mass. Okay, guys, that was Catholic Chronicles number one by Keith Green. My next video, I will be sharing with you guys Catholic Chronicle number two, where he's going to go into the sacrifice of the mass. Again, I'm sorry for all the little slip ups. There were a lot of little like just weird things. I'm reading this off of a website called the spirit watch for anybody who might be interested in that it doesn't say does it say the year that this was published um kind of curious about that um But yeah, he he had these. Um, he used to send out. Like, again, I really I really think I want to get that book and share it with you guys, because he truly was an inspiration with so many things like. You know, he was so. With his music, like I said. Um, so good. His music was selling. He, but he didn't keep the royalties. Like he, um, okay. Though it's been, he's been gone for years, killed in a tragic plane. He was killed in that plane crash in 1982. Um, so I'm assuming these, these were coming out. These were coming out. Um, in the early 80s. Like, I, I think that, like I said, from what I understand, he started putting these out, you know, 
late 70s, maybe like 79, 80, 81. Um, but they would send these out free of charge. They would just, you know, they, I think that their ministry, he had a whole ministry. It was called like the last day's ministry. Um, they would ask, you know, they, if you wanted to give a donation, you could give a donation, but him and his wife, they lived very humbly. Like they weren't rich or anything like this. Like, um, they tried to live you know, they, they donate, most of their money went towards missions and because they were big on missions. Um, and like, just, you know, helping people. And they, this newsletter that they were doing, essentially, they would just give it to people for free. It was free, but there was just a lot of things. And like I said, I wanted to share it with you guys today because it is something that I find um, important personally. I, I think um, there's a lot going on right now um, in Christianity. Sorry, you can't, when I take a drink, you can't see my fake background or you can't see me. <laughs> um. You know, there's just so much going on with um, the whole unity coming, you know, in Christianity that we all should be coming together to um, under one banner of faith, you know, to, uh, world peace, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Pope Francis is, you know, speaking out against, you know, whatever climate change, blah, blah, blah. There's so many things that are happening right now that are, that are definitely prophetic, um, concerning, the Catholic church and um, like, for example, just off the top of my head, one of the big things that I see happening um, is, you know, this whole chosen series that has been out now for a few years now, maybe three, four years. Um, the main actor in that, the, the guy there that plays Jesus, he's a Catholic and I've noticed that um, because of that, you know, it, it's it's like almost like a lot of people are going back to Catholicism that will maybe left. You know, I think there was a time like I want to say, you know, in like the 80s, the 90s. Where, and especially when all of that stuff started happening where they were really getting exposed with the uh, pedophilia cases of the cases of children being raped by priests and stuff like that, that like in the 90s where that really exploded. And, you know, where I'm from, actually in New England, uh, I'm from a city named New Bedford, Mass, and I don't live there anymore, but I that's where I grew up you know, from 10 years old on through uh, my school years there. That city has the most Catholic churches um, than any other city in the United States. It has like the most, it actually it has the most Catholic churches on one street, I think, than any other. It's in the World Guinness Book of Records. But anywho... Um, I don't even know why I thought of that, but I did. And I guess what I'm saying is that I've seen in my lifetime, and I didn't grow up Catholic, as some of you may know. I, I, if you've been on my, if you've been on my channel, and I've, you know, you've watched some of my other videos. I grew up Mormon, but, um, but I grew up around a lot of Catholics, and um, a lot of my friends. Cat or cat are Catholic, were are whatever. Uh, 
my point in saying this is that the shift I've seen, okay? So there was a big shift in the 80s and the 90s when all of those things were coming to light. Like it was especially in the Boston Archdiocese, like they were being, they were big in the headlines with, you know, the victims that were now adults were coming to sue the church and stuff for the, for the, the abuse that they endured. And so there was a pushback. There really was. And, and a lot of people were walking out of the churches and leaving the churches. And like, now I know why I brought up New Bedford, because I remember a lot of churches in New Bedford, Catholic churches I'm speaking of now, were shutting down. Nobody was going to the churches. Any, they, they, the, 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 the membership was dropping um, dramatically. And a lot of these churches that were some of the oldest churches, Catholic churches in the country, were shutting, closing their doors. I remember that. And, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback and a lot of people left the church and a lot of people said enough, you know, um, with all of the hypocrisy in it and then all of the, the sexual abuse that was going on. And, uh, but now getting to today, what I'm seeing happening is I've seen a lot of people going back. I, I'm seeing a lot of people going back because they, you know, they really went out on a campaign, a campaign, honestly, ever since like when Pope Francis became the Pope, I really saw a big push and of really campaigning towards trying to get the people to come back into the church. And, uh, you know, we had the Passion of the Christ movie come out in 20, I want to say, 05, 06, something in there. That was a huge move because Mel Gibson is a very he's catholic and he's doesn't he's you know he's very open about his you know very passionate about his catholicism and you know he made that movie and that movie was a huge blockbuster um and and don't get me wrong like i've watched the movie numerous times i i can appreciate it for that for the what it is but you can't deny the strong undercurrent catholic um influence in there there's a lot of emphasis on mary in there and just you know the the how you know mary is like so you know it, you can just you see when your eyes are open to this you see it um and you know, you had that. There's just been a lot going through the last years that I, I've noticed of a push. And, you know, and then you had because a lot of people left Catholicism and they went into a lot of like non-denominational churches or things like this. And now I see this, this just this pattern, this thing of like the, the a lot of the non-denominational churches have gone so wackadoodle off into wackadoodle land with all of the craziness that that's going on in those churches with the all the different you know people on the floor shaking around rolling around and people you know just the craziness of all of it okay that a lot of people are like in you know with the music and the repetitive music and it's like you feel like you're at a concert and you know, they're really geared towards trying to appeal to the young and the hip and the trendy stuff. And, you know, it's a, it, it's become a turnoff um, for so many. So I, 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 a lot of people are going back to the more traditional, uh, you know, ways, right, of maybe how they grew up with, in, and that's, you know, in the Catholic Church or whatever it may be. And I get that aspect of it. I understand it. Um, but and getting back to the chosen thing, that's a big player right now. It's a big player right now because, like I said, the guy that plays Jesus in that, he's a Catholic, pushes Catholicism. He has that Hallow app that is, I heard, it's the most popular app in the United States or Christian app. 
Okay. I should clarify in the United States is the Hallow app and they have like Mark Wahlberg and Jim Caviezel, the guy that played Jesus in the passion of the Christ. And they have this other guy, his name's Jonathan Rumi, who's the guy who's playing Jesus in the chosen. They have him on the app where he, they pray the rosary and they, and you can pray it along with them on this app. And <laughs> I mean, and it is, it's, it's become the most popular Christian app in the U.S. and a lot of people have turned to Catholicism. I'm not kidding. Through the Chosen series, because they've been watching it and they fell in love with the series, and they're like loving the series so much because it, you know, the way it portrays Jesus. You know, they they are they're like they like are now like oh, you know, because the the whole thing of that Chosen series is it, it makes Jesus more human like us like you know like it portrays him in such a, a way that's like so we can so relate to him so much better and and we can uh you know understand and we feel like he understands us you know through that show it's like you feel closer to him you feel uh you know like jeez you you know who jesus is better now and, and and more comfortable with him and more just more intimate with him i'm not kidding and People are watching this show and, and they're going on that Hallow app and they're getting the Hallow app and they are being little by little, they're being, you know, um, pro brought into Catholicism. They're, they're being, they're putting, they're, they're giving into these uh, false doctrines of things like praying to the rose, the rosary, praying the rosary, praying to Mary, praying to dead people and you know you can't take of the holy eucharist unless you are um officially uh baptized and confirmed into the catholic church so you have to be go through all of that to take of the holy eucharist but anybody can get this app and start praying with Jonathan Rumi or Jim Caviezel or Mark Wahlberg. And then before you know it, you're like being seduced by this harlot church. And because that's what it is. You know, I believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the harlot that's spoken of in the book of Revelation that is drunk on the blood of the martyrs. And I'm sorry if that offends anybody. Okay. I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying any of this out of malice or to, um, you know, attack anybody. I literally, I am doing this out of love because I love people and I love the truth and the truth is Jesus Christ. And the, the, the source of truth is the Bible and the word of God. And there is nowhere in the word of God. What I just shared with you from Keith Green's Catholic Chronicles, I think he laid out a lot of really good stuff the way he worded it. I'm sorry if I was, you know, kind of tongue tied and slipping over some of my words, but I hope you guys got, uh, you know, uh, understood what I read and I hope that you know, in, in everything I, then what it shared, you, your eyes were opened if they weren't already to that truth that Jesus didn't mean for us when we take of the Lord's supper, communion, sacrament, whatever, that we're literally eating his body and his flesh. He didn't, he, that's not what he meant in the Bible when he did that. It was, it was a, symbolic thing it's symbolic of the what he was about to go do after he did that with his disciples at that passover meal that seder that he did with his disciples in the upper room he was telling them this is symbolic of what is about to happen to me <laughs> i'm about to go shed my blood give my body over to be tortured and killed for you. 
you know, and, and, and do this to remember me for what I did, for what the sacrifice I made in that because I made the sacrifice, you now are, you know, have reconciliation and you can have eternal life, you know, because of me. So it's, it's, he never, ever said it was never meant to be, we're literally eating the flesh and the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And the early church before Catholicism was even a thing, because I'm doing a whole study on early church history with my kids this year for homeschooling. So I've learned a lot. They, the early church, they were actually one of the reasons they were being persecuted. Um, and being, you know, sought out and, and everything was because of one of the things was because of the misinterpretation of this, because they were, you know, they have their communion where they take of the bread and the wine or the, you know, and they say, we do this in remembrance of our Lord Jesus for what he did for us and they eat of it. But it's not literal. And there were rumors going around that it, they were doing it literally, that they were eating flesh and blood, literally eating flesh and blood. You know, and that was one of the big things that was a big problem for the early church, because people were thinking that that's what they were doing because of the symbolic, you know, ceremony that, that they would take partake of. This is how Jesus told them to. He said, remember me when you partake of wine and bread, you know. So, again, there's so much confusion and, you know, and, and what does God tell us to do? He tells us to be like the Bereans, to study our, the word and to seek these things out for ourselves. Don't depend on your pastor, your preacher, your priest, your whoever, your bishop, whatever, to give you the, you need to go to the Bible yourself, open it up and ask, pray for the Lord to show you the truth in his word. If you're confused about something, pray about it, ask God to show you the truth and he will. If you, if you sincerely ask him for the truth and you seek him diligently, he will show you the truth. He will reveal the truth to you and you know, I'm going to close with that because that's the topic that we kind of got on tonight. I could go on and on, guys. I really could because the times we're living in, the deception is so thick and it's so heavy. And, um, you know, but I do, again, I do see a lot of people going back to Catholicism and, and going back to these these religions, these older, you know, more traditional uh, religions, whether it's orthodoxy, Catholicism, um, whatever it is, you know, Lutherism, um, Lutherans, or whatever the case may be. Um, and I, I, again, I get that aspect of it because the, the, the whole non-denominational Pentecostal blah, blah, blah church has gone off to wackadoodle land. And with that, people are like, oh, this is, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I get it, but I also see that the powers that be are playing right into that hand right now and leading people back. So just be aware, be aware of what's up. And um, again, the Lord will lead you, the Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth and understanding and teach us if we ask him. So... Continue to pray, guys. Continue to study the word. Continue to seek the Lord in your life. Um, stay close to him. It's it's really, it, it's crucial. Crucial. The days we're living in are no joke. And it's no time to fool around with, you know, the things are winding up. Things are winding up. And, um... We need to stay strong in the Lord and stand firm on his word and his truth. So in that, I'm going to go. And next time I will be sharing 
the second part to this Catholic Chronicles with you. I, go, I hope that somebody out there benefited from this. You know, I bless somebody out there. I, that's my prayer. Even if it's just one person. Um, and remember, this is my little catchphrase with my, my new channel's name. Like I said, it was really my first original name for my channel, but I'm going back, okay? Um, there's always a reason to smile with Jesus. Don't forget that, guys, okay? No matter what you're going through with him, we always have a reason to smile at this future. That's why I love that name so much because this the future looks bleak, but with Jesus, it isn't. We have a very bright, beautiful, unimaginable future coming. This is just the beginning. So God bless you guys. Till next time.